Well, look, I, I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, we were we were just talking about it a few minutes before uh, we got started. Um, you know, culture, uh, high achiever mindset. Uh, these are all things that are, are very near and dear to myself. They're, they're things that I preach in my own consulting practice. I, I know they are to you as well. Um, c- culture, culture's interesting. I mean, I think culture is like the most important thing for any successful business, any successful startup. Uh, but it's not necessarily always easy to define, and it can mean a lot of different things to different people. So I'd, I'd love if you start off by maybe just helping you know me understand your definition of culture and how you look at culture in the in, in the work setting. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I think sometimes culture is seen as some fancy words on the wall, having a ping pong table, maybe access to some beer, um, and then that's culture, right? Um, of course, that's not really the case, and I think it's been misunderstood a long time. So if we talk about the fundamentals, like what's important to consider as you're building a company? So the old way of building companies is putting profits first, then customers, and then people. And that have led to that 85% globally are not engaged in their work. And we can see that with a great resignation. We can see that with consumer behavior changing and customers being less and less loyal to only profit a profit only companies and cultures. So what's the alternative? And what's this new thing of really designing and scaling a thriving culture? Well, it's really putting people first, then customers and then profit. Because when you do that, people who believe in what you believe in will be attracted to what you do and why you do it. And they they will thrive. Um, And that will mean that it's gonna be easier to co-create with the market and really create that long lasting uh, loyalty and bond with the customers or clients you're working with. And that's gonna create sustainable and profitable growth, right? So by getting the foundation right and having the courage of really designing and scaling a high achieving culture where you celebrate people with the same values that are deeply committed to the path that you are on, that's basically the start. But the second piece we need to remember is that culture can be designed. And it's not just something that happens or just stays with the company for years or generations. It actually can be designed, but it takes that decision and courage to design it and to design it well. So to answer your question, fundamentally culture comes down to building your cultural foundation, which is your purpose, mission, vision, and values. And let that design and influence which behaviors you want to drive and what you want to celebrate. So it's on, um, it all comes down to the founders um, and the, the leadership, sometimes the investors do, uh, of the company that's being built. And, you know, like when a startup's getting off the ground, I mean, you, you know, many cases, you're just trying to survive, right? You're just mm-hmm. validate your idea, you know, mm-hmm. figure out how to potentially raise some capital. Sure. Uh, you know, you start to rate, you know, you start to bring in your first couple of employees. You're trying to convince people, hopefully skilled people to, mm-hmm. to join your vision. Um, it, it can be easy to forget about those type of fundamental pillars that early in the company, but, mm-hmm. but, but it's important that you really, from the beginning, you have to set that foundation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one way of looking at it is that if we don't design a thriving culture, what's the opportunity cost of that? That can be uh, a toxic or a mediocre culture. And that's going to make it significantly more difficult to attract that top talent we always talk about but also attract the right investors that are investing in your company for all the right reasons and have the same timeline and vision for the company as you as a founder have. And the other thing is that if we don't invest in culture, it can very quickly become a liability. And um, most of us know, I've been running companies for 20 years, that we will come across um, challenging challenges along the way that really triggers the realization that this little decision over here, I'm not prioritizing the seemingly in unimportant thing like quote unquote culture can cost us a lot of time, grief, effort, um, of course, capital later along the line. So one thing I would encourage new founders to think about, it's really how we relate to each other 
and how internally in the company and how we relate externally to our customers and the, the other people, our fans, our investors, our partners, and how we, and, and the glue there really is the culture. So if you get it right, it's a huge competitive advantage. If you get it wrong, it's a liability. Yeah. No, I, I look, I couldn't agree more. I, I was first introduced, um, to a, a philosophy called the Rockefeller habits, probably in like 2013. It was a, it was an early startup. I was brought in on, um, the founders, a guy named Vern Harnish. He's gone on and, and written scaling up. And now it's a, you know, a pretty well-defined management philosophy, but, um, you know, when we were introduced and, and we had some professional coaching come in, which was so valuable. And by the way, mm -hmm. I would, I would recommend to anybody out there, it's an investment worth making to bring people like yourself in who can help guide and help with structure around this. Um, you know, we were introduced to, to very much what you talked about, right? The mission, vision, values aspect of it, right? The mission is why you're doing what you're doing. The vision is uh, what you're trying to accomplish, but then the values of the company, it's how you want your people to operate and how you want them to work and, and whatever those, you know, those statements are, you need to make sure you're supporting it on a day in day out basis. If you know, um, our, our, our coach at the time used to always say, you know, you build culture by who you hire, who you fire and who you promote. And, and I yeah. think that there's some truth to that. And it's a little bit of a darker way of looking at it, but, but in some ways people are going to look around and the people that are making it in your company and the way they act, if they're following the core values of your company and the type of company that you want to be, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's teamwork, you know, they're going to understand that that's what's important to your culture, where I think a lot of people, and, and to your point, you know, to the ping pong tables and things that are written on, on walls, you know, they'll, they'll have the, uh, the posters that'll say collaboration or they'll have you know, exactly. whatever it might be, but, <laughs> exactly. but, but, but then the highest paid person in the company is the sales guy. That's the total lone wolf that, you know, puts his commissions above anybody else in the company. So it's like, mm. really, are you really about teamwork? Or are you really about money and you really about profit? So, yeah. um, look, I want to dive all, I want to get deeper into all this a little bit later, but let's, let, let's take a step back. I, okay. I, I want to, I want to learn a little bit more about your journey. I want to learn a bit uh, more about how you got to where you got to. Um, I mean, you yourself were an athlete, um, correct? Yeah. I mean, maybe you yeah. can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so when I was, I think seven or eight, um, I did about eight different activities every week. That was normal to me. So it was basketball, it was um, ice skating, it was dancing, uh, it was gymnastics. There were all these different things. So I've always grown up in an environment where sports and activities and being active and learning from, from different disciplines is just ingrained in my background. Um, and I was playing basketball and it was one of my favorite sports uh, of all of them. But I had a defining moment um, when I was 10, actually. Uh, so I was in two different teams. One of the teams, I was an average player and um, because it was a really awesome team. <laughs> and the other team, uh, I was the star player. Uh, and that was a newer team. And there was one game um, with, um, with the team where I was the guard and, and the star player. Our coach had a personal emergency five minutes before we had a very important game. And we were meeting a team that was significantly better than us. Like, even if he would have been there, it would have been a challenge. Um, we were, we as a team were way over our head. But, and I love the game. And especially when, you know, when you're a guard in basketball, which I'm sure you and a lot of the listeners know, you direct the game, right? Um, so we started and we didn't have a coach since he had a personal emergency. About 10, 15 min minutes into the game, I'm realizing as I'm playing that I need to make a decision. Either I'm uh, deciding to stay on the game or I'm deciding to go off court and coach the team. And that split decision of realizing that I need to leave the court, even how much I even love the game, I'm not meant to do that. In order for us to have a chance to compete and win, I need to be the coach. And that was the finding moment really in the background. 
there's more, but that's the beginning. But that's amazing. That's amazing. So yeah, your your coaching career started when you were. Uh, would you? How old did you say you were? Ten years old at this time. Yes, I did a lot of things early. <laughs> that's, <laughs> just, that's just one. Um, I love that. But but I realized also that you know I love team sports. A lot of the sports I did until I was twelve or so, it was team sports. I would draw to team sports. But I realized that in order for me to get a good workout in, <laughs> or to actually be able to win, um, I was inclined to focus on the other players and focus on the collaboration and helping people to thrive in their positions. That's not the best thing to do if you actually are playing in the team, right? That's literally the coach job. So uh, that led me to uh, a couple of years later, started to pursue the main, the main activities, which was really um, fitness or natural bodybuilding uh, was the uh, the term today we didn't really have the term natural bodybuilding back then but that basically means um um it was very similar to to fitness just focus on building muscle and, and definition and it's a whole lifestyle right you i lived in the gym <laughs> um yeah. and then doing that with kickboxing and dancing all at the same time because why wouldn't you that's so right. uh <laughs> so that's really how how it started and uh um uh, it's fascinating when we are looking back on these defining moments during our path that a split decision when you are a child can really help define the path uh, of your life. So that is one of those moments for me with, with a basketball story and then later pursue things that were more in line with my scrums, actually, as an athlete myself. There, there's an Arnold Schwarzenegger quote, and I, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, so I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just sort of summarize it. But he basically says something to the extent of physical fitness tells a lot about an individual to the extent of they're willing to work hard, they're yep. willing to put their natural impulses aside, they're willing to be disciplined with nutrition, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and other things in their life. And I, I think that that's you know very true. Right. You know, the, um, you know, being an athlete doesn't always need to be that you are a professional or paid for the sport or whatever it might be. Like, you know, if you're someone who's willing to train and to work hard and to compete and, you know, in, in many cases, sacrifice, um, you know, to be great, what you, you, you want, you know, those are the types of things that I think translate really well to entrepreneurship and, you know, is, is, is a big part of, you know, I, I think, the messaging that I want to get across with, with, with this podcast and this medium. But, uh, you know, you talk about high achiever mindset a lot professionally. It's, it's, it's a, it's a part of your, your practice. Uh, maybe you can give me a little bit more about that. Sure. There's, um, if we tie it back to sports, so there are a lot of lessons that, um, I gained during, during my years of really living in the gym and, um, uh, going into the ring and fighting at the time I was, um, a lightweight. And I realized that in order to, to really excel as a fighter, I needed to uh, go up against people that were better than me and stronger than me and physically, um, um, taller than me. So I started to do that. And I realized that, um, technique beats raw strength a lot of the times, right. But also the, the idea that things that we sometimes believe is permanent is really uh, temporary. And you know that when, if you're pursuing athletic sports in any, in any discipline that you might be starting working on something, you don't see progress, you don't see progress, you don't see progress. And then after a while, just working on it over and over and over again, you realize that you're actually building the foundation of, of uh, your future of your company. So, um, part of the higher achiever mindset is really living in line with your values and your purpose. And that then can impact the culture of your company, which we can talk about a little later, but it's also understanding your, your life philosophy and building that hard work and resilience where no one else is looking. Like, as I mentioned, I started uh, my first company when I was 17 within management consulting and I was living in the gym and did the, the fitness uh, and fighting at the same time. It was just a lifestyle, right? And realizing that the more we live in line with our, our values and treating things as a lifestyle and not separating things into buckets that might not even be our own buckets, it's much easier to thrive. 
And one of the, um, I remember I was about to do a keynote. Um, I think it was in Paris or London. And I was asked for like, what's your personal philosophy or motto in life? I'm like, that, give me, <laughs> that's not something I had like in a one liner, but, um, so I had about 10, 15 minutes to, to, to think about it. So they were very generous with their time there, um, being sarcastic here. Um, and, um, uh, I summarized the two strive for excellence, work hard and trust the process. And I think that's what where the link is between pursuing something athletically and uh, building a company or living with a, the entrepreneurial high achiever mindset over time. And it might not be strive for excellence for you. So it's the key thing here is that it's authentic and meaningful to you. But for me, it really captured the essence. So striving for excellence also means to, to work hard when no one is, is looking and having that grit, determination uh, and focus because you're doing it because it's important to you for whatever reason that is. Well, you know, grit is, I love that word. And, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with just, you know, I think if you were going to pinpoint one thing that makes a successful entrepreneur versus somebody else, it's grit that, you know, you yeah. can say education, you can say, you know, intelligence, you can say whatever it is, but, but the truth of the matter, it's just somebody that's just willing to just grind and work and do what they need to do. And, you know, you made, you made a point a, a minute ago about, uh, you know, not seeing results. And, you know, and I, I think the analogy is like, it's like going into the gym, working out one day and looking in the mirror and being like, ah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in shape yet. This, this entrepreneur thing's not working, right? It, it's right. sort of analogy to that extent. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, for, for what, what a lot of people don't realize is like, it isn't, the overnight success. I mean, maybe in a blue moon, those types of things mm -hmm. exist, but even these companies that a lot of people think are overnight success, those founders have been at it for years and years and years and grinding and driving. And, you know, there's been little course corrections along the way and sometimes pivots, but you know, it's that person that has the stamina and sort of that, uh, that mentality of, of, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to make this happen. Those are the ones that usually succeed. <laughs> Yeah, and I find it fascinating with the definition of success. So I, I have a tendency to use other words like um, thriving, fulfillment, um, words like that. Because depending on the culture, so uh, I spent my time over Europe and the US, and just between the two continents, the definition of success, the word success, mean different things, right? But typically, success might not even be your own definition. So it's really important to, to take a step back and recognize and like, what does success, if you want to use that word, even mean to you? Um, because most founders, they are not necessarily driven by that. They're driven by the process of achieving something or striving for something that is seemingly impossible. And I can definitely uh, speak to that for myself, like the thrill of being able to achieve something others are perceiving as impossible. Yeah, it's a personal driver uh, and sometimes in, it takes you down a path that um, pe some people might seem a little crazy, but that's part of the, the, um, the process and the, the joy of pursuing something that is really meaningful to you, to you right? So um, I think there is the overnight success, uh, if we're using that expression, that can take 10, 20 years. It's, it's not just, you know, from one day to another, just as it takes yeah. years to build a physique. Go ahead. No, that, I think that's really well, well spoken. Um, you know, something I've, I've had some conversations with, you know, just in my own peer group, you know, we talk about, you know, quote unquote success and what success means. And, mm. you know, I, I think a lot of founders, um, you know, people out there that are thinking about it, you know, it, it, it can be measured by monetary purposes. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but the truth of the matter is, you know, and, and psychology shows, I mean, there's psychology studies yep. that money can impact happiness to a point. I mean, if you have no money and then you have good money, like you're going to actually be happier, but mm -hmm. there, there becomes this point where the line just crosses and more money doesn't make you any more happy. So, you know, enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey of the entrepreneurial, uh, you know, it's, you know, for me personally, and I, I it definitely resonates with me. 
I'm a competitive person by nature, but I also yeah. love to create. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the part that I enjoy the most, right? With anything, it's, it's having an idea, having a concept and pulling all the pieces together and then eventually kind of stepping back and looking at this thing that you helped build and, and feeling like, Hey, I, I did that. I put that together. And, you know, when I recruit people as well, you know, that's, that's a big part of, um, you know, I think the culture that I try to build in companies that I've, I've managed and I run is, you know, I want people here that want to be entrepreneurs that, that want to be able to put their thumb on things. You know, one of the lines I always say is, look, mm -hmm. if, if, if you, if you want to show up and have a playbook put in front of you with exactly, this is how you do your job on a day in day out basis. And you can punch a clock in the morning and a punch a clock on your way out, go work for a big company. There's plenty of big companies that you can do that <laughs> yeah. and have nice, successful yeah. careers. But mm -hmm. if you want to build something and you want to be a part of creating something, then, you know, come work at a, at a startup or a scale up or whatever you want to call it. So, no, I, I appreciate you, um, you sharing that. I have, I have one question for you. I was, I was just thinking about this. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you do a lot of public speaking. You do a lot of keynote speaking. Uh, I know you get in front of big audiences and you talk. And in some ways, that's, you know, terrifying to a lot of people out there. But then you've also, you're a fighter. So mm -hmm. I personally can't think of anything more terrifying than, than standing <laughs> up head to head with somebody about to go to, to combat. So what what's more frightening to you? Um, if they know my Achilles heel in the ring, um... That would be a problem. I wouldn't win the game. I wouldn't even uh, win that fight. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't know. Terrified. Um, I don't really get terrified much. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that um, I don't experience feelings of um, of negative feelings of any kind. But there's a couple of things that sort of I live by and one is connected to to regret. I actually don't believe in regret. And if that is a philosophy you fully um, embody, that means that even the moments when you make mistakes or hard things happens, as long as I made the decision that was most based on all the information I have, and it was the best decision at the time, um, that was the right decision. So there's no room for regret. So in regards to um, to being on stage, I grew up on stage. I started to perform when I was three. I started, I took private singing lessons, not because I'm a great singer, I'm really not, um, for several years to learn how to breathe properly. And, um, but I think the, the essence, when you are in the, the ring to fight, um, it's more about yourself. And when you're on stage as a speaker, I'm just a messenger. So I'm there to empower the audience or to, to make a difference in the audience's life. So in a way, that's way more fulfilling than being in the ring. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, even if I still fight it once in a while, um, it's less part of my lifestyle today uh, in favor of really uh, being able to be on stage and, and share, um, share wisdom, knowledge, experiences, stories, and being more of a facilitator, as you know, as a fighter, it's, you need to protect yourself and it's very much about the next game and you need to be, you know, um, light on your feet and stuff like that. But on stage, it's about the interaction with the audience and the impact you can have in the world. That's what excites me. Absolutely. So how, wait, you know, I know you do a, a, a lot of consulting, a lot of speaking, um, you know, you, 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 we talk a lot about culture and some of the different things that you bring to the table. How involved do you usually get with, with different companies and with, with different organizations? Do you, do you come internal and we'll work with CEOs and work with management teams and, and, and help them beyond just giving them advice and giving them guidance? Yes, that's a great question. So um, Reimagines, um, which is my um, company, is really split into three pieces. So one piece is training. Uh, and that's where the keynote speaking comes in and also training programs for uh, the founder, CEO, um, they, they're high achievers, as we call them, uh, and high potentials, people that can become high achievers. The second bucket, it's really uh, the journey I started as my uh, in my first basketball game of really being the, the champion of these founders, sometimes investors too, uh, working with them one-on-one. 
uh, helping them strategically, operationally, tactically, and dealing with the roller coaster, as you you very well are aware of, uh, of running uh, a company or running a fund. Um, and um, um, specifically, the people we work with there, they t- we call them high achieving empathic givers. So high performing individuals driven by make it, making a difference and driven by, uh, by impact and um, uh, giving back to the world, basically. And then the, the third portion, which is the biggest portion of reimagines, that's really uh, cultural transformations. And here we have uh, a significant amount of, amount of programs and initiatives that we do with companies. So everything from, um, uh, currently there's one client that is going through a merger, they're in biotech, and we're helping them with the cultural integrations of the two companies. Um, there is uh, one company in SaaS out of Europe. Um, it's really helping the uh, this purpose-driven founder and CEO that have been at it for almost 20 years um, to help him scale and stay strong to to the mission. And they are doing their best year ever <laughs> with uh, 45% growth this year. So that's, that's incredible. Um, um, but it's also taking uh, a Series A company, for instance, and then working with them all the way up to exit, which as you know, can take years, uh, and guiding them through the different cultural challenges uh, that are coming up and making sure that they are able to keep and attract high achievers that really thrive within the culture that they are aiming to to create. So uh, it depends on the complexity, um, uh, how much I'm personally involved, but I'm quite hands-on. <laughs> so, um, 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 but t- it's ve- very typical that we are in a company over several years and, uh, and help them in different capacities. Sometimes it's just with the CEO uh, or founder, and sometimes it is with the entire company. And then of course, uh, my team is also part of that. Purpose-driven companies. Um, I, I've done a lot of work recently in uh, the direct-to-consumer space, and we've worked with a lot of different product companies that have come up with new products. And without a doubt, uh, the, the the way that industry is moving is towards purpose-driven brands, brands mm-hmm. that have a reason for what they're doing. Uh, yep. we've, we live in a world where everything's kind of commoditized. I mean, you can go online to Alibaba and pretty much any product in the world can be mass produced in you know Asia and, and sent to you. So those the, there's, there's no shortage of stuff. People now want stuff that, that re- represents who they are and their own personal beliefs and, and those types of things. And, and I, I couldn't, believe more in, in, in building a purpose-driven company. And I, I, I understand how that plays into the culture side, but there's also this reconciliation with, with money, a fiduciary, right? The fiduciary responsibility of a CEO is to the shareholders. Um, I'm sure investors are, are looking at returns and it's a little bit of chicken and egg, right? Because by being a, a purpose-driven company, by building a great culture, by being able to recruit and bring amazing people, by being able to connect with your customers, you're going to make more money and you're going to be more successful, but it also takes a little bit of time. And sometimes you have to forego maybe short-term profits for, for a longer term initiative. So I'm just curious as, as you, you know, work with founders, as you work with uh, venture capitalist investors, how do you reconcile the two? Yeah. So that brings us back to, to what I mentioned in the beginning of putting people first and customers and then profit. And that's basically the people and purpose centric approach. So the, um, the interesting thing is that it's not just a matter of hitting the targets, but how are we hitting the targets, right? And um, founders and investors would surely know that if there's just one toxic individual in the company, that can actually, um, it can make or break the company, probably break the company um, if he or she is not removed. So, and that can be very difficult. <laughs> um, so it's, um, the, the starting point is really understanding that by getting it right, it's easier to create customers, uh, um, relationship with customers or clients where they, they feel seen and they become more loyal and they are willing to, to accept a higher price point if that's even needed. Um, in exchange for working with, with a brand where they believe in what they believe in. I can give you an example. So 
I was about to go to a conference in a hidden part of Italy. Uh, it was an unconference. It was 50 people from around the world. We were all flying in and I was flying in from Brussels. And the night before the organizer called me and say, hey, um, we don't do um, transfer from the airport to, to the conference. Um, uh, is that a problem? I'm like, uh, yes. Uh, thanks for telling me at 2 a.m. I appreciate that. It was an excellent conference overall, but that was a bit of a rocky start. So I basically had a decision to make in that moment. So either I could fly with an airline that I fundamentally disagree with their values, Ryanair. I don't fly with them. And, or I could fly to Rome. And mind you, it's the other side of the country physically. Uh, drive through the mountains at night in the rain by myself. And at the time I hadn't been in a car for, well, I had been in a car, but I haven't been in a driver's seat of a car for a couple of years. And also driving in Rome, uh, I'm sure some of our listeners have done that. That's not the most pleasant place to, to drive. Um, so I could either book that flight uh, and go with an airline that aligned with my values more or less, or I could compromise on my values and fly to an airport close by. Um, and that was, that was an easy decision to me. Yeah. So I flew to Rome and had one of the, the worst drives in my life. Uh, now it's a great story, <laughs> but it wasn't that enjoyable at the time. The thing is that this is just one story, but it sort of demonstrates the shift in consumer behavior that we are willing to go through more trouble to live in line with our values. And it's not just a few, it's, um, there are millions of people that are doing the same choice. So now my argument is that in order to stay competitive and stay in business by not being people and purpose centric, you're actually jeopardizing the, the future of the company. And by embracing it now, you have a huge competitive advantage because there are a lot of cases where companies have embraced it and they are thriving. Their people are happy. They're making good money. The customers are overjoyed. And um, isn't that the point of why we do what we do? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, that's amazing. I, I, I think that's a great example of, uh, of, of, of a shift, a consumer shift um, and, and, and the importance of it. It actually reminds me of, uh, do you ever watch Ted Lasso? You ever, you ever watch that show on, uh, oh, I haven't, no, I haven't. There, there's a, it's a silly show. Uh, okay. it's, it's, it's really good. It's really funny, but, uh, it's a, you know, a, a soccer club that's, um, in England and one of their main sponsors in airline. And one of the star players is, uh, from, uh, West Africa. And his dad calls him up and says that, oh, that, you know, I can't believe that's your sponsor. These guys are, you know, taking advantage of the land out here and they're mm. destroying our country and they're blah, 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 blah. And mm. he, you know, stands up and he goes out to the next soccer match and he has a, a, a tape over the logo of, of the airline. And of yeah. course, it's all fictional. And, uh, mm. you know, then the, the, the team rallies around him and of course they, they change sponsors. But, you know, I, I think that's an example of, um, you know, a, 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 the culture of that club, you know, of, of, although fictional, that they were willing to support what was right and support one of their players versus go with the corporation, which was paying a lot of money for that sponsorship. But two is a perfect example. Like, you know, we live in a day now with, with social media and, and especially just, you know, the cultural shift in, in generations, you know, younger generations are much more aware than, you know, quite frankly, my generation and the generations that are older than me were that if you don't think about this from the beginning, it, it, it literally could be the life or death of your company. So, um, yeah, I, yeah. I love that. That's, that's something you're sharing. So a question, you know, as you come into these companies and, and I don't know how your experiences have been, I know with me, a lot of times when I'm brought in, there's something kind of wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. You know, it seems like the companies that everything's going perfect. They don't necessarily look for outside help. Right. So you, you, you at least in my personal opinion, a situation I've been brought into a lot of these companies that, that have had some issues. Uh, what, what is, you know, and, and maybe it's different for you, uh, but what are some of the common mistakes that you see that were made maybe a few years before you got there that if that entrepreneur maybe took a different path, 
you know, things could have been a little bit better uh, down the road. One of the, um, there, there are several things here, but one thing that is very common, um, especially when you work with these awesome human beings, is that they have been exposed to, um, we call them a toxin, or we can call them a shark. So a bad person that, um, uh, or people that is trying to destroy the company is actually taking pleasure in other people's pain. It's very hard for most of humanity to understand this because it's not how we are wired. That's why, why we have created, as part of our, our cultural work, we have frameworks, method, processes, but we also have language to make it easier as humans to actually talk about what is what here uh, and sort it out. So one of the, the most common things is that they have come across uh, toxicity of some type, and it can be a co-founder, it can be an investor, it can be an early employee. And that can, that can be devastating uh, if the company survives, um, because as you know, founders are very resilient. Uh, so they, they probably survived, but it, take it, it took a really deep toll on them. And there might be deep rooted doubt and if they if they're on the right path, if they're doing the right thing for the right reasons, et cetera. So one of the first things is really to see, okay, do we have any any toxins in the company right now? And if so, um, we need to remove that because that's really it's like a cancer in the company, right? It's it's very dangerous. So, so how, how do you how do you identify the toxins? Uh, well, it comes from experience. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, uh, there, there are certain behaviors that they tend to showcase. One thing to look out for is that, do you feel that you need a whisk and a blanket to recover from an interaction with this person? Uh, so do you feel drained and like, okay, I need, I'm usually not tired, but I need to lie down now because this was exhausting. Like, um, that is an indication. That's probably um, one of the first things to look out for. But um how do you, how do they make decisions? Are they making decisions just for themselves? Are they doing things that it's actually working against the company or working against uh, the humans in the company? Um, those are just some, but there's a lot of things to look out for. Um, but that's the starting point. Uh, another thing that I see a lot, so let's say that um, that didn't exist or that's removed, what do we do next? It's really to build a strong culture foundation. And that's what we talked about um, earlier with the culture and the purpose, mission, vision, and the values. And that basically drives the behaviors and create the foundation of how do we relate to each other. Um, if we don't have that, it's very hard to recruit on culture, to train on culture, to, to lead on culture, you know, all those things, right? But the other thing is, do they actually want to have, do you actually want a high achieving culture? Or are you happy with a culture where people are cruising? Like what you said before, the playbook, doing the minimum, the nine to fivers, they're checking in, they're checking out, they're not really contributing much. And it's difficult to have a mixed culture where you have people that are cruising and high achievers in the same, because you need to lead them differently. You need to delegate to them differently. You need to engage with them differently. Um, it's possible, but it's, it, there's a lot of work to do that. So that's typically step two uh, after the foundation is built. Okay, are we committed to a high achieving culture and are you willing to make some hard decisions to ensure the future of the company so in the, that you can keep and attract these high achievers as your company is growing? And then creating the processes, really. So we are quite uh, focused on not just having the language, but helping them scale. Because as you know, and I'm sure you have seen this many times as a founder and investor, in the beginning, you might not have the structure needed as when you are 40, 50, 100, 200 people, uh, and there needs to be some of that um, built and put in place in order to keep a thriving culture. Uh, so that's typically what happens after that. So, uh, but it typically starts with identifying, okay, do we have any, <laughs> who are the, the, the sharks we need to remove? And who are the people that are really the champions here and that are deeply connected to, to the mission and the vision uh, of the company? We, no, it's great. We, we all <laughs> want to hire high achievers, right? I mean, any company out there is mm -hmm. going to say that. 
sometimes there's challenges with the fact that, you know, maybe you're an early stage company and you don't have top dollar. So you, you know, you can't afford the, the, the best of the best talent. Um, sometimes maybe you just, you don't have a, a, a great talent process in place. Talk to me, like what kind of advice you give to a entrepreneur, someone who, you know, mid-sized company, uh, you know, maybe there's a couple A players, but a lot of B and C players, um, you know, people try hard. Can you, can you turn a C player into a B player, a B player into an A player? Uh, what can they do different in the recruiting process? You know, what advice would you give to a founder? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, first of all, we need to look at opportunity cost here. So in theory, can we, can we turn, if we call the C player, the, the, the person that is cruising, doing the minimum, can we turn that into, we call them high potential, a B player, if you want to use that language here. Um, can you do that? Well, the answer is probably, but it's going to create a lot more effort. So if we go back to the sports example, uh, I was never a runner, like coming from bodybuilding, fighting, dancing. Running is not my thing. I'm not going to compete in a marathon. I'm just not built like that, right? So could I train for a marathon? Hypothetically, sure. Uh, would I be a good runner? Absolutely not. Would I be a decent fighter? Yes. So it's the same thing with the C players, right? Can we empower them? Yes, but is it worth it? Well, most of the time not, because we also have, it's not just the opportunity cost, it's time. You only have so much time, effort, and, and resources to dedicate to these things. So instead of doing that, and this is very much how, how the old philosophy is created, like, oh, we just need to, to fix the C players, and then the B players will be a little better. Well, the problem is that for A, if we, again, high achievers or A players, for, for them to be around C players, that's draining. And it's going to be very hard for them to perform and peak their performance and thrive. And it's going to be very hard to, to attract other high achievers. We do like to work together and create magic together and create things together and work out together, but it's draining to have a lot of others around, right? So there is also the hidden opportunity cost of mixing these teams. So in theory, yes, in regards to B players, it sort of depends. So if they uh, are aligned with the values and um, they have some raw talent, Typically, they need more mentoring, guidance, training, and absolutely, they can turn into to A players or high achievers. Another thing I, I want to point out is that high achievers and why we use these terminologies instead of A, B, and C, not all of them are, um, are salespeople. Not all of them are extroverts. Like, this is people that they can have any type of personality, different skill sets, different background, different ages, all of that. But one way of demonstrating that would be to say, take you, Greg, as a high achiever at heart, and then we, we put you in the, uh, in the postal service. Nothing wrong with, um, with that, but I'm going to guess, first of all, it's going to be very difficult for them to get you, but if they would, two things will happen. Um, you're probably going to stay for three to, six, uh, three to six months, typically, and then leave because you were like, I will solve the culture that's not really reality. So I can't really be my best here and contribute. Or you're going to drop down and sort of look for an outlet to be able to perform and thrive outside your work at the Postal Service. So it's not just a matter of finding the right high achievers or A players. It's the people that actually um, fit in your culture and can contribute in your culture. So it's a little bit more complex than that. And this is why, again, we have frameworks, processes, and models for this to make it much more understandable because it can become very complex quick if we don't have a language around it, right? So that's the starting point. But to answer your question, if we invest in high achievers and A players, they, since they are the heart and soul of the company, they will be able to contribute even more to your vision and your goals. And they might even be able to attract other people like themselves. I argue that that is a much better use of your time resources than focusing on the C players that may or may not um, join uh, your mission for real. In a situation like that, where an organization has to go through a top grading process, because um, that makes a ton of sense. 
How do you message that or how do you do that in a way that uh, keeps morale high? And, and I've personally had to go through this, uh, unfortunately, a handful of times where, mm. you know, we've had to make pretty large changes in, in organizations. And I, you know, I think one of the most difficult things to do is, is to message that in a way that the, the people that you want to retain and the people that you want to keep stay, stay motivated. But I'm just, you know, curious from a, from a, from a coaching, from a consulting perspective, you know, as you're sitting in a boardroom with a, a leadership team, who's, who's going to go through something like this, you know, what's that conversation like? So it depends on the starting point of the culture. And if, if you think about it on a, on a scale from one to hundred, so one is a toxic culture and hundred is a, the most thriving, amazing culture you can imagine. So it sort of depends on, okay, where's the starting point? We have a mixed or mediocre uh, somewhere in the middle, and then it's going towards thriving after that. So we typically, we don't work with, with toxic cultures. We work with mixed mediocre uh, but aspiring towards thriving, right? Or thriving already. Um, they still have challenges. They're, they're just different type of challenges than you see in mixed, mixed cultures. So it's basically recognizing that it's not just overnight, like, oh, now we're going to get rid of all our C players or the people that are cruising. It's giving them a chance to level up or level out. Yeah. And inviting them to be part of the journey because again some of them they have the the determination and the will but they might have been under so-so management for instance if you have one cruiser that had been managed by another cruiser the first the the cruiser had been managed by this cruiser or sea player he or she might not have a chance to to really step up right they might not have had the right mentorship or guidance. So to understand that it's a process, but um, coming back to, uh, to the heart of the question is really, can you afford not to have a thriving culture and uh, a culture that champions high achievers if you wanna stay competitive in the marketplace, especially in the long run? Because one thing that uh, the big corporates, one of the few <laughs> thing the, uh, the big corporates, um, have to their advantage is economy of scale. So in a startup, we need, need to get to a certain point where we have economy of scale, and then we might have the possibility of having people that are not doing very well, right? But again, the, the cost of C players is much more significant than, uh, than I think the conversation is usually um, had around it because it drives away the, the A players in the long run. And then you might yeah. be stuck with a couple of A players or high achievers, and then the majority is, they don't really care. And then the only thing you can rely on is economy of scale. But if you are a high achiever, how much fun will you have running that company? You know, one of the things that uh, I've used in my own companies and I've, I've, I've helped advise on is a simple quadrant where we do performance reviews based on it, where the X axis is performance and the Y axis is cultural fit. And we'll ask our team to go through and rate every single employee. You know, what, what are they on a scale of one to 10 from a performance perspective? Where are they from a scale of one to 10 on, on a cultural fit to the company yeah. that they adhere by our cultural values? And you obviously want everybody in the top right quadrant. You want people who are high performers. You want people who are, are, are great culture fits. Anybody in the lower left quadrant, it's like a no brainer, right? These people aren't performers. Nobody, they don't, they don't fit the company culture. They, 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 they're out. The most dangerous, uh, people are actually the ones that sit in the top left quadrant. These are the people that are cultural fits. People like them. They're fun. They come to all the happy hours, you know, like, oh, you know, that's, you know, oh, Bob, Bob's been with the company forever. Everybody loves Bob, but they're complete underachievers and they don't perform mm -hmm. well. And it actually drags the performance down, right? The other people in the company, it's, it's, it's obvious. Nobody likes them. Like you said, I, I love that a whiskey and a blanket after having an interaction with these people. <laughs> yeah. You're like, it, it, no one's going to mind if that person's, um, you know, asked to leave the company, but it's that, that, that person who, who, you know, everybody kind of likes and gets along with, but just doesn't do the work or just doesn't really care beyond, you know, that nine to five punch in the clock. And, you know, you can work with those people and you can try to bring them into that, that high achiever, um, quadrant, but, but in many cases, it's really difficult to do. Um, so, so moving on, I mean, cu culture is really interesting. And I think, 
you know, when you think of traditional culture in a company and building a team, you know, COVID's changed it in many ways, potentially forever, right? The, the remote workforce, I, I think it's, it's here to stay. I, I, I don't think that that's like a little fad and we're going to get back to the, you know, everybody shows up five days a week, you know, spends 40 plus hours a week in the office, you know, where, you know, technology like we're using today has come so far. We all feel very comfortable in our home offices and, and, you know, it's forced us to sort of adopt this. So, um, you know, one of the things I know you talk about a lot in your practice and in your coaching and your businesses is, is, uh, the future of work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that that does have a lot to do with, with, with culture and, and, you know, a high performance work, um, environment, high achievers, what people want and what people are looking for in their own careers. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, your philosophy there and your thoughts there and where you see the trends are moving and, and, you know, how you're messaging this to the, to the people you consult with. Yeah. Future work is a huge topic and, um, I started to talk about it years ago, uh, so way before COVID. And um, what I focus on is really the human side of future work. Because what I notice, as you know, again, I've been in the tech, um, uh, tech and startup world for almost 20 years. A lot of future work is focused on the tech. And sure, the tech is cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but fundamentally, uh, I believe that the tech is there to serve humans. Humans are not there to serve technology. Right? So it's a matter of, are we building technology that really serves humans or not? So that's the starting point of how I approach um, the human side of future work. So for instance, uh, I wrote an article um, a couple of years ago, and um, well, we publish articles every week, but I, I wrote it for, for a publication. And one of the things that we, we talked about in the article was really the surveillance culture. Um, uh, today we can track people a lot. The problem with that, and sure, you can look at, you have this dashboard, you can see how people are moving their mouse and how many emails. Yeah, that, that is driving high achievers away. So if you're committed to a high achieving culture, you need to understand that part of how you lead them, we call it futuristic leadership. There's multiple pieces to that, but one of them is to give them autonomy. And both autonomy and working where and when they are creative and productive, which goes way beyond the home and the office. Um, and I've been taking pictures around the world on beaches and hotel lobbies and, and um, in uh, airport lobbies and all kinds of places where I've been working. So I've always believed in working where and when you're creative because the environment we're in are impacting our, our performance, creativity uh, a lot, right? So that's part of it. But as we are looking at this new era, it's just important to remember that the solution is not to add always more technology, but using technology that is empowering the behaviors you want to champion. So for instance, if you want people to, to collaborate more uh, or co-work more, yes, you can have them to co-work together and, and sort of set goals for a 45 minute sprint or something, and then share their achievements in the group those things are available to us, right? Regardless if you sit in, in Buenos Aires, uh, New York or London. But with that said, it's just uh, important, just, just because we can do something with technology doesn't mean that that is the right decision, especially if we're committing, uh, committed to a thriving culture of high achievers. So you coach a lot with entrepreneurs. You do a lot of work with entrepreneurs. It's, it's really your life's work in many ways, but you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. yourself. Uh, and there's, you know, there's like an old saying, it, it's something to the extent of like the, the, the cobbler's kids go without shoes or the, the, the painter's house sure. needs painting. <laughs> sure. Right. You know, and, uh, you, you know, you spend a lot of your time coaching and working with these entrepreneurs, but you have your own business that you're running yourself. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the, the lessons that you've learned in your own journey, you know, for your own business and building your own practice. Yeah, there, there's a lot there, but I think one thing is really, one thing I've always personally been attracted to is acknowledging potential um, and looking at talent from all across the world. So right now I live in eight time zones 
We have clients in many countries, team members in many countries, um, everything from um, from 25 year olds to 60 plus, maybe even 70. I don't know. I don't really care. So be looking at individuals potential and then leading them on that potential and sometimes giving them projects, opportunities, tasks that are a little beyond uh, what they believe they can do and then coach and guide them through that. That's very fulfilling. Um, and something that I, um, I definitely strive to, to do every day in my leadership, um, with my team and our, in our growing company. Another thing I talk a lot about, and it's connected to the high achiever mindset is lifestyle design and lifestyle design fundamentally comes down to living in line with your purpose and your values and showing up, um, uh, according, showing up with the behaviors that matches that. So practically speaking, when we talk about, um, uh, lifestyle design and peak in performance, one easy way of doing that is to understand your internal body clock. So if you understand your internal body clock and for, for listeners that haven't heard that before, um, the, the Nobel prize was given for, for this research a couple of years ago, and it's remarkable. Um, and it's called the circadian rhythm in, in a more formal uh, manner, if you will. Imagine that we are either larks or owls, and there's a sliding scale here. But there's going to be um, times during a 24-hour cycle when you have more energy and when you have less energy. And if we can match what we're doing throughout the day with our internal body clock, our internal cycle, so it goes up, peaks, goes down a little, there's a little valley. You might have experienced that valley after lunch, for instance, if you're a large. Yeah, th that's not you being lazy. That's your body clock. <laughs> so that's not the time to like, oh, I need to push through. No, that's the time to, to do something a little bit more chill. And then there might be a little peak later. If you're an owl, which I am, so a night person, um, I don't do a lot of meetings in the morning. Um, I'm not very good in the morning. It takes me a little time to wake up and then I can work late into the, the nights. So it's not unusual uh, for me to have sessions uh, with founder CEOs way into the 3, 4 a.m. Uh, at night. Uh, mind you, I don't wake up at that time. I work until that time, just to clarify. So, but that's a way to peak performance, right? So one thing that we are teaching our clients and um, I'm speaking about from stage in sessions, but also with our own team members and advisors is to help them to live more in line with our own values and understand some of these essence, like their own body clock. So of course you need to be, be showing up for client meetings and stuff like that. But a lot of the time we have more flexibility than we sometimes remember. Uh, because as you know, the society is very strict and like, okay, we, um, uh, we have the nine to five and that was a great invention by Ford, but we don't really live in a factory society anymore. Um, and I think his innovations when it came to, um, um, to the car and, and how, uh, how he democratized, um, uh, private transport was quite remarkable, right? But when we look, and, and of course the, uh, uh, the conveyor belt, but when it comes to how we define a work day, whatever that means, well, we have sort of moved past that. Most people are not living in a factory environment. So breaking free from these rigid structures that is not even our own, that worked once upon a time, but doesn't really work very well anymore. That's part of that. Um, there's a lot of stuff, but, but the two essence here is really leading on potential and then tapping into lifestyle design so you can peak your performance. And if you peak your performance, you're also going to increase your well-being and your, your fulfillment and sense of achievement, which is kind of important for most people. So there's a lot of benefits. Um, so that's something I talk a lot about. Absolutely. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you feel is important or that you wanted to, uh, you know, let, let, let the listeners out there know about. Yeah. If I would, uh, leave you with like, um, where can you start? Um, if you want to pursue culture, 
So first of all, recognizing that culture can be designed. And there are a lot of people out there that have done it before you. And a thriving culture is really championing high achievers. So people who believe in what you believe in. And the journey is so much more fun um, as we are on the roller coaster if we share it with like-minded change makers and rebels, right? So that will be the first advice to, to recognize that culture can be a competitive advantage and a play and uh, create a platform where both you and other humans can thrive. The second one would be to explore lifestyle design, like what are your values, personal values, and how can you allow those values to permeate and influence the culture of the company you're running a little bit more and not just subscribing to philosophies that may or may not be internalized or important to you. Because the more we do that, we don't just get happier and we, we live more successful lives, but we also thrive more. So those would be the two, design culture, and explore lifestyle design. Thank you so much for coming on. It was uh, it was fantastic to talk to you. There's so much wisdom. There's there, there's so much there. I feel like we could talk about all this for hours upon hours <laughs> upon Absolutely. hours. Absolutely. <laughs>